What's up guys, Evan Jarvis here for PokerCoach.com and today we are gonna talk about an extremely important concept in poker, knowing when to quit. The old saying from rounders was, when the money's gone, it's time to move on. Personally, I think that we can quit long before the money's gone and we can follow a better mantra, which is don't let one bad session wipe out four good ones. In our previous presentation, we talked about how to make $100,000 a year playing online poker. And part of that is gonna be all about protecting your losses and minimizing your losses during losing sessions and maximizing your gains during winning sessions. So let's talk about the baseline methods of when to quit. There are two methods you can use that are your baseline for when to quit your session to protect yourself from catastrophic losses and help yourself get your maximum gains. The first one is to set a set time. And I learned this from Dan and Ground Use Masterclass. I used this when I was playing online poker sessions as well. And it was to check in after a certain amount of hours to ensure peak performance. For me, when I'm playing online poker and multi-tabling, I find that putting in about two hours of play allows me to stay at my A game. And then after I hit the two hour mark, and a lot of times even at the 90 minute mark, I start to see a slight drop off in my play, which progressively gets more and more pronounced until the point that I'm at the two and a half, three hour mark, and I can see a significant decrease in the quality of my play. Now for you, that might be a different amount of time, and I invite you to watch your play and check your time while you're playing your online sessions and noticing at what point does my quality of play start to drop off? At what point do I stop going after the pots that I know I should be going for and play more aggressively? At what point do I try to protect a win that I have? At what point do I start playing more passively, for example, and consider checking in at that set time every time you play a session to determine if you wanna keep playing. When I'm playing live poker, on the other hand, that number tends to be around four hours as opposed to two because, well, in online poker, I'm multi-tabling, I have to make a lot of decisions very quickly, processing statistics. Live poker is a much slower pace. There's a lot less information coming in that needs to be processed and digested, and therefore there's a, a lower drain on your brain while you're playing live poker, which leads to typically being able to play longer while still being in a state of peak performance. So again, for me, the sweet spot is two hours of play online. I like to do a check-in. And when I'm playing live poker at the, about the four hour mark, I do a check-in and we'll talk more about why on a future slide. For you, it could be anything. It might be 30 minutes. It might be an hour for online poker. It might depend on how many tables you're playing. That's typically a key factor. And it will evolve as your stamina does. So another thing you can do is check when you're one tabling, at what point does your play start to drop off? Whereas when you're four tabling or six tabling or nine tabling or 12 tabling, at what point does it seem like your play starts to deteriorate? And make note of that so you can be more conscious in future sessions and make better decisions about when to check in so that you can ensure you are executing peak performance when you play your poker sessions, at least the majority of the time, if not all the time. The second baseline method that we can use when deciding when it's time to quit a session is a stop loss. And a stop loss is typically an amount of money that we know once we lose more than that amount of money, we're gonna hit a state of numbness. We're gonna hit a state of kind of no return and there's no way we're gonna be able to recover the quality of our decision making once we hit that point. Now, typically this is a pretty significant loss amount. Uh, for me, it's probably around eight buy-ins in online play and typically around four buy-ins in live play, that when I hit that point, I know it's very unlikely my quality of play is gonna come back because I'm gonna be in a bit of a chasing mode and I'm gonna be in a bit of a frustration mode. So for you, it's probably gonna be a different number than the ones I've outlined, um, but it's good to be aware of it. And take note, this is a number that should rarely be hit you're very rarely during the course of a session gonna hit the point that you have to execute your stop loss, but that's kind of just a hard stop that will protect you from continuing to play when you're frustrated, almost guaranteed to be tilted because you've hit this kind of volatility threshold of the most negative variance that you can withstand before you're just thinking, I'm done with this game, I can't stand it, but you, you still might be chasing. So we'll talk more about that on a future slide as well. Uh, so we can expand and talk about a more conscious approach to both 
why these two things are really useful and as well as a method that we can use that's not just a baseline method but that's a bit more intuitive and allows you to really maximize your gains these are more about protecting your losses the intuitive method the conscious approach is about maximizing your gains so let's take a look at that setting a time to quit which will give us a bit of a deeper dive into the mental game of poker and first question is why would we set a time to quit a session you know why wouldn't we just plan to play forever and quit when we get tired well the thing is when you're playing a poker session you're probably going to be at your best at the beginning of a session when you have the most energy you have the most mental energy you have the best state of focus you have the most motivation you have everything working in your favor and you want to get in your reps when you're in that state the same way when you go to the gym to work out you typically want to do a short workout for a set amount of time, you know, maybe 30 to 45 minutes or an hour if you really want to push it. So you can get really quality reps in and train your muscles in a way that they're, um, that they're working at their best. When we are training our brain, when we're playing a poker session, we want to make sure that we're getting those quality reps in so that we're focusing on doing the right things, having the right habits, focusing on the right things. Because the more we train a habit, in this case, making poker decisions, the more likely we are to access that state as a default when we are playing poker sessions. Whereas if we put in a lot of poor quality reps, we put in a lot of sessions when we're really tired, when we're exhausted, when we're chasing, when we're gambling, that's gonna be the programming that gets imp imp imprinted into your mind and is gonna be kind of your default for how you play. And we don't wanna be training the low quality play, we wanna be training the high quality play. So setting a time ensures that you get the quality reps in when you're playing at your best. It helps you build the habit and stamina and also allows you to see, I can play poker for an hour and that's just fine. I can play poker for 30 minutes or do a study session for 30 minutes and I'm gonna get quality out of that that's gonna pay dividends later. Not every session has to be a marathon session and um, that's one reason when it comes to tournaments that practicing with sit and goes is very useful over exclusively playing large field MTTs that are going to take a very long time. This also ensures it's easier that you can actually show up and get your time in and get your reps in because becoming a fantastic poker player, a world class poker player is all about consistency and getting those quality reps in, not just binging on a quantity session. So. That is the benefit of setting a time to ensure you get in there. Now let's talk about the risky times to play so that you ensure that for the most part, you're gonna be getting quality reps in. So when you have unmet needs or unresolved issues before you sit down and play a poker session, those are gonna come with you to the table and they're probably gonna negatively affect your play. So there are four main things, uh, four main states that we're gonna be in that are typically gonna to lead to negative play. The first one is being hungry. Obviously, if you're hungry, um, your, your brain's not gonna have all the fuel it needs to function, exception is if you're used to fasting, um, and it's gonna be a lot easier to get tired. And it's also worth noting, the longer that you play, you might get hungry because our brain is using sugar to make those decisions, and when we run out of fuel and we run out of reserves, our body doesn't know what to draw from to make those decisions. So it's important that we check in with that set time to say, oh, am I hungry? Do I need some food? Okay, cool. And then we can refuel the mind as opposed to just running on the adrenaline and running on the dopamine that comes from, you know, playing awesomely fun games like poker. Second state is when we're angry, right? If you're in an angry state, you're probably not going to make those calm, rational decisions. It's much more likely that you're going to end up making emotional decisions and we don't want to have emotion at the poker table. Also note, the longer you play, events will happen that can cause anger or tilt. Examples are bad beats. Examples are missing out on a big draw. If you, you know, expect to say that draw, uh, entitlement, where you're entitled to a pot that you end up losing, being around people who are in a negative state, being around people who are complaining, um, little frustrations that can happen at the casino. There are many events that can happen, you know, noisy TV, um, noisy other tables that can lead to feelings of anger. So it's important over the course of a session to check in at that set time and be like, have I hit my threshold of, of emotional capacity and I can't handle it anymore and I'm kind of breaking down. Maybe I need a reset or maybe I'm fine. Next one is when we're lonely. Uh, the less social we are, typically if we're in a state of loneliness, that can lead to a bit of a like depressive feeling. 
and it can lead to needing to get a win from the session to create a positive feeling because we don't have that positive feeling already as a baseline. Um, a lot of times when we're sitting at the poker table, since it's a battle, it's a bit of a war, we feel like we're sitting with enemies and that can lead us to feel progressively more lonely. Yeah, so being social at the table is gonna help to decrease that and diminish that, um, but also just checking in at that you know two hour mark or four hour mark or whatever it is will be very helpful and then maybe you go talk to your poker buddy or make a phone call or do something to reset that will allow you to feel like you know you're connected and you're not feeling lonely and that'll help with that need uh last one is when we're tired obviously if you haven't had a lot of sleep your brain's not going to be firing at its full potential and it can lead to making less than stellar decisions Note, the longer that we play, the later into the night it gets, we are gonna be feeling fatigued, we are gonna be feeling tired. That's where, you know, typically people use coffee and espresso and stimulants that will help. Um, and it's, it's important to gauge the quality of the game to decide if it's worth using, you know, something like caffeine to keep us going, or if it's better to go get a good night's rest and come in really fresh with that higher quality sleep and higher quality energy. Okay, all these things are natural. All these things can happen. So checking in at a specific time to see, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? Is very useful because when we're in the game, it's hard to check in on those things because we're focused on playing. But when we step away from the game, we can actually check in on those things and say, okay, how am I actually feeling? And then make a decision based on that. So, yeah. Cool. All right. So the best times to play, counter to the risky times to play when the needs are met. Make sure if you're feeling fed, calm, connected, and rest, you're probably gonna play your best poker. And when you're in the middle of a session, if you can check in and ensure that you're meeting these needs and resetting these things so that you have a full tank of gas ready to go, you're probably gonna make your best decisions and get your best results. Coming into a session with the expectation of, you know, I wanna win big tonight or I wanna double up fast. These are going to lead to kind of typically forcing the issue because you have an unmet need because you have an unmet expectation. So coming in with no expectations, and just the intention to play your best poker is typically going to lead to the best results. Um, accepting that variants happen, accepting that bad beats happen, and that they're part of the game will also lead to having less of the frustration, less of the anger working against you and allow you to just play your best poker, um, being in a state of peace with what happens with where the cards fall and where the chips land to. And in the long run, you're going to be coming out ahead if you can follow that. So be zen. Uh, either unaffected by events that will allow you to play longer sessions, or if you have a difficulty doing that or you haven't built up the stamina to, stamina to do that, then just be willing to make good quits when you hit those points when you're feeling off. There's always going to be another poker game. You can always play again tomorrow. You can always play again next week. It's not the end of the world to make a quit. Uh, go home, reset, and get ready for the next one. Cool. Now let's look at a stop loss, a little bit of a deeper dive why we would use it. And the main thing is to avoid the point of numbness. So when you don't feel the losses anymore because you've kind of lost so much in one session and you're so frustrated and you know there's no way to get back to even, it's really easy to just stop caring entirely. If you've played underground poker games, you know that sound when someone's like chips, 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 and they're calling for chips all night and they just get buried for you know, 10, 20 buy-ins and crazy amounts of money that are extremely hard to recover. Um, it's important that we quit before we hit this point, okay? Just like being blackout drunk, where you've had, to, where one's had too much to drink and they are making awful decisions, there's such thing as blackout gambling where we've lost so much, we're so disconnected from you know, the, the, the pain of losing and the feeling and the significance and the meaning of the money that we're just making awful decisions all over the place. This is the thing that happens. Just like there's a risk of taking too much of a substance and you know being left in a really bad position there is a risk of taking too much risk during a session uh, and busting your bankroll i've definitely done this before in my younger years and i have no problem uh, admitting that and sharing that so it's important to have this stop loss to say i know that when i lose whatever it is four buy-ins six buy-ins eight buy-ins that my quality of play is awful and i'm taking tons of risk and splashing and playing loose and so when i hit that point I'm just going to quit. I'm going to have a hard stop. And rarely are we going to have to reach this, but it protects us from the catastrophic losses that can just wipe you out, wipe out your bankroll and all that. So an important thing is to make sure your stop losses aren't too small, like two to three buy-ins, because that's going to be natural variance that's going to happen during the course of a session. And if you have a stop loss of two to three buy-ins, you're going to be quitting your sessions way too early and missing out on plenty of opportunity. So it's important to be comfortable with the usual variance of a session and the swings that are gonna happen. 
and setting a stop loss that's more rarely going to be instituted, but going to be protecting you from really low quality play when it does. This is why we don't keep all our money in one place. This is why we don't bring the ATM card with us to the casino, why we don't withdraw from the credit card, because we don't want to be in a position that we can bust our entire bankroll on one session of really bad tilt and really bad decision making. This is why your pocket bankroll, the money that you bring with you to the casino, is separate from your total bankroll, the money you leave at home or the money you leave in the bank. This is why your bankroll online is not your bank account and why we have money that we can play with online versus money that's cashed out and protected and would require time to get back in play because that time in between is going to be the time to reset and check in and say, oh, I can make some better decisions than this. Let me check myself and let me get my head back on straight. Okay, cool. Now, quality of play is more important than the quantity of hands played. In the previous video on the channel, we talked about how to make $100,000 a year. Um, that volume is important to getting results, but it's not just about putting in the volume. Focusing on purely getting volume can lead to a trap. And that is because not all sessions are created equal. If you could play 50,000 incredible hands of poker, playing at your A game, your best decision, versus 100,000 hands of average quality poker, you're probably going to make more money on the 50,000 high quality hands than you will on the 100,000 average hands. Uh, and if we start adding in bad quality hands in there, you can imagine how that's going to affect things. So the quality of your play and the quality of your opponent's play is almost like a multiplier on your winnings per hand. And that's how you can see that playing quality hands is worth a lot more than just playing quantity hands. When you're playing well and you're in a good game, you like to squeeze as much juice out of the situation as possible. And that's where we're going to talk about the more conscious approach to quitting that's going to ensure that you can make the most of your sessions when you're playing well and you're in a good game. So take a note. Making good quits is more important than making your hand target for a session, a week, or a month. The target, the goal, the amount of hands that we want to play is all about setting a target to get us moving in the right direction. It doesn't mean that we need to hit the target exactly. The, the check mark of completion is not necessary. The important thing is moving towards the direction that we want to go. And that's what having a hand target per session or per month will do. It's gonna help you say, all right, I'm gonna sit down and try to play whatever it is. 1,000 quality hands today, 2,000 quality hands today. If you make it to 800, fantastic. If you need to implement your stop loss after 200 hands, because it's just the worst day ever, probably better to do that than to force yourself to play 800 more low quality hands that are gonna have a negative effect on your bankroll. Better to come back fresh and maybe play 1,200 hands for the next four days to reach your target at the end of the week. Or just say, if I hit 4,000 hands this week instead of 5,000, it's still a win because I'm building the habit, putting in reps, putting in quality play, and setting myself up for a uh, great year of poker and potentially a great career of poker. So when we focus on purely the quantity and we say we have to hit the gold and we have to get that check mark, gold star, whatever it is, that can lead to forcing the issue, which rarely works in your favor. So while it's useful to have a target, we don't always have to hit it. And if you feel like that's something you need to do, I hope that takes some weight off of your shoulders. I know it did when I learned that. Slow and steady wins the race and it's all about just following a quality pace, moving the right direction playing quality poker, putting in quality hands, and really just making those quality quits. So let's talk about the finer approach of knowing when to quit now that we know the importance, the value of making good quits, and we know the baseline approach, which we're now building on. So there are three things we wanna focus on when following this finer approach. The first one is quality control. How is the game? And the questions that you wanna ask yourself to figure out what the quality of the game is. First, where do you rank? Are you the best player in the game? The worst player in the game? If you're not the best or the worst, and when you're the best, you should keep playing. When you're the worst, you probably shouldn't. How many worst players or fish or spots in the game are there? And that's gonna determine how much dead money there is in the game and how likely you should be to stay in the game. If there are a lot of worse players than you, if there are a lot of spots, they have a lot of chips in front of them, it's probably worth continuing to play. Whereas if all the weak spots have busted and everyone's playing really good quality poker, you're just kind of average in the game, there's probably not a lot of need to force a long session or force a lot of hands in that game. So next question is, how is the lineup? 
who is winning and who is losing. Even if you're in a game with a lot of great players, if they're steaming, they're on tilt, they've hit that point of no return and they're playing really bad poker, they've become a spot. So just because someone's a regular, just because someone's typically a good player, doesn't mean they're gonna be a good player on every night. And typically the players who are losing are gonna be playing worse than the players who are winning. And typically the players who are losing a lot are gonna be playing worse than the players who are just losing a little. So it's really valuable to look at who's winning, who's losing and how much and using that to rank the quality of the game. Next is how is everyone's mental state? And it kind of ties into what I was saying before. Who's on their game, who's tilted? If you got a lot of tilted players, probably worth staying in the game. If you got people who are all on their A game and you know maybe you're not there, then it's not worth staying in the game and that would be a good time to quit. Next is the technical game. And that's, so the, the quality control is how is everyone else playing? The technical game is how are you playing? Are you playing technically good poker? Are you following? the material and the strategies you learned at pokercoaching.com. If the answer is yes, you're good to go. If the answer is no, maybe you wanna check in on that. Are you taking the spots as they come? Are you maximizing your EV? Are you playing aggressively and putting pressure on your opponents? Are you willing to take on risk? If so, keep playing. If you're playing cautious, if you're trying to protect a win, if you're just playing kind of timidly, passively, it's probably something's going on and it's worth quitting the session to come back in sharper, motivated, more energized, whatever it is. Third, how are you feeling? And again, this is a check-in on you, and this is the value of having kind of that two or three or four hour check-in mark. Are you playing your A game, B game, C game, D game, E game, or F game? If you're you know, at the top there, the A or B, you can probably continue playing. If you see yourself dropping the C, D, E, or F game, uh, it's clearly a sign that it's time to quit the session. Okay. So again, just the key questions, reviewing them. Where do you rank versus the players on your table? Best, worst, somewhere in the middle. How many spots are on the table? Are there bad players, recreational or dead money? Who has the most chips in front of them? If the recreationals have none of the chips and the regs have all of them, then it's probably a bad game, even if it used to be a good game. Who is off their game? What kind of bit, bad beats have happened? That's gonna throw people off their game. Has there been trash talk? Has there been confrontation? That's often gonna throw people off their game because it's showing they're in a charged emotional state. Um, did someone get beaten by their villain? Now, if someone has an arch nemesis and that person's getting the best of them, that's going to cause a lot of emotion and probably a lot of poor play. Is anyone getting too drunk? Is anyone stuck too much money? That's going to lead to them being off their game. Did anyone come in kind of rattled before the session started and you can tell that they're just trying to get their emotions out through the game? Then that's probably going to lead to them playing poorly as well. Big question, how much dead money is on the table? What are your chances of getting it? As I said on the previous slide, a reg can be dead money if they're playing poorly and chasing losses. So if you wanna write down these five questions as kind of a check-in while you're playing, feel free to do so. Uh, it's very useful stuff to check in on the quality of the game. Okay, so we have gone over the quality of the game, we've gone over the quality of your play, both the technical game and the mental game, and we've gone through both the conscious approach, the refined approach of knowing when to quit, and the baseline approach. So let's go through these points one more time. The baseline approaches for knowing when to quit. A, set a time. That gets you to hit a minimum target of hands, gets you building the habit, and gets you ensuring that you're putting in quality play and most likely playing in a peak performance state when you're putting in your sessions. By having a stop loss, you can limit the backwards momentum and guarantee kind of a maximum downswing per session. This is how you can ensure that one bad session doesn't wipe out four good ones or eight good ones or something like that. And Ideally, it's rarely going to be triggered because it would take a lot of negative variance for that to come into play. Next, check in on your mental game. By focusing on having a high quality mental game, focusing on showing up when all your needs are met, not playing when you have unmet needs, you're going to ensure that you have the best return on investment per hand because you're going to be making those high quality expected value decisions. Next, check in on the game quality. This is going to ensure that you have the best return on time investment for the time you put in. So again, the mental game, and the game quality are about adding the multiplier to your winnings per hand. The set time and the target number of hands is about ensuring you actually get a large enough sample to receive the rewards of your win rate. And the stop loss is about protecting those really big downswings that are gonna happen very rarely, but can lead to getting a really bad mental and emotional state that can lead to poor play. So stop loss, 
Set time is about getting the reps in. Stop loss is about protecting from major losses. Mental game and game quality is about maximizing your multiplier and your earnings per hand and your win rate. Because this way you'll be playing in games with high EV due to there being lots of dead money up for grabs on the table and you're gonna be in your best state of mind to capitalize on that. Cool. All right, so that is gonna wrap up this presentation on knowing when to quit and how to ensure that one bad session doesn't wipe out for good ones. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a thing or two. This has been Evan Jarvis for PokerCoach.com. If you wanna learn more and keep leveling up your poker game, check out this playlist right here. And until next time, you know what to do. Take what you learned, go out there and get stacking.